So this is my mic? Great, okay. So I um, had uh, the great pleasure of being, I guess, a guest here at a SUSE conference uh, to, I guess, pitch this kind of program that came out of uh, Andrew Sturminger's group at Harvard and has kind of been developing in different ways um, over the past just shy of a decade. Um, but the point of today's talk is to at least make sure that the, like the, the starting point is clear so that we can then get to some of the recent things that we've been um, figuring out. Um, let's just start from like the motivation for this program. Ah, great. Okay, so we basically expect quantum gravity to be holographic. So for whatever bulk space time we have, we want to look at how to encode that in this non-gravitational theory on the boundary. The classic success story, of course, is ADS-CFT, but that has the wrong sign cosmological constant. So there are various attempts over the years to try to apply this framework to various astrophysically relevant contexts. So let's play a little game of Goldilocks here. Um, if you wanted to stick to some ADS geometry, you could, instead of saying that's the full space time, zoom in on some uh, near extremal, near horizon region um, and have some sector that's ADS. And that would be the Kerr CFT correspondence work uh, that people have done maybe a decade ago. Of course, we really want to go out to a cosmological um, like version where you have uh, the right sign cosmological constant, and that would require us being able to either rotate from, uh, like change the sign of the cosmological constant or a start from um, the De Sitter correspondence. So I would say that the program that I'm gonna be talking about today, Celestial CFT, is trying to do this happy medium <laughs> where we're spanning physics from collider scales up to um, say, like measuring gravitational radiation coming from some in spiraling binary system, which is well approximated by vanishing cosmological constant. Now, of course, one can always complain that I am going to literally say my space time is asymptotically flat, and then my data lives at the conformal boundary and push that through. Um, but in the end, we want to really think about this program as telling us something about the S matrix. Okay, so. Now, to get on to the, every cult has like their terminology. So what is the celestial holography trademark? It's a proposed duality between gravitational scattering and asymptotically flat space times, and a CFT that lives in the celestial sphere. So you look up in the night sky, you see where all the stars are. That space is our celestial sphere where we're gonna basically put operators and say that those operators are corresponding to excitations that like create scattering states uh, for a given S matrix process. Okay, so the main takeaway, if you guys fall asleep after three minutes, is that the point of this program is it's supposed to reorganize scattering in terms of the symmetry. So we wouldn't be doing this kind of change of basis of my S matrix if we didn't think that it was gonna have something coming out of it. And in particular, there's basically an infinite dimensional enhancement coming from the asymptotic symmetry group. And this is something where if I'd started with ADS CFT and then try to take a flat limit, I need to be very careful about how I take that flat limit and how I change whatever boundary conditions I have so that I really do allow for like incoming radiation and outgoing radiation and recover this asymptotic symmetry group that I know that I have if I started directly from the asymptotic structure of Minkowski space. So what's the outlined and or checklist because for a short talk like this and with an audience that's not in this little niche, uh, I'd be better spend most of my time setting up the case for why I would even do this in the first place. But that's gonna be the majority of the talk is bullet point one. And then I'll make sure to give some obligatory shout out to where Susie's helped in the story. And we'll close with some ongoing questions where we can talk about recent things that are like um, kind of under development right now and why we're still excited about this. Okay, so our goal is to apply the holographic principle to vanishing cosmological constant to understand quantum gravity in these asymptotically flat space times. And the plan is to show that the picture on the left can be mapped in a way that's useful to these punctured spheres and um, talking about some radial quantized theory on that. So when I say asymptotically flat space times, because it's a broad audience, I mean I have zero cosmological constant, but I have non-trivial matter distribution. And once you do that, then your metrics are no longer gonna be exactly flat, but there's gonna be some perturbations. And the point is, is that the very large scale structure that you get, if you look really far away, is still gonna have the same causal structure as Minkowski space would. So let's go through the Penrose diagram for Minkowski space because, okay, so this is actually relevant to when I want to compare Minkowski CFT to an ADS CFT context. The key difference is basically the structure of this conformal boundary. So I have spatial infinity where if I just took a time slice and go out, I would go here 
Now, of course, if I evolve for any infinite amount of time near spatial infinity, I'm still near here. So the points uh, just above and just below that I zero are misleadingly <laughs> like close to each other on this diagram. But still, light rays go at a 45 degree on this line. So I basically just try to plot Minkowski space onto a sheet of paper and still capture the causal structure of the conformal boundary. So the part that I'm most interested in is where massless excitations enter and exit, and that's going to be called scry minus and scry plus. And then if I were massive and just sitting along a world line or accelerating but never constantly accelerating so that I'm approaching a, a like trajectory, then I would start at um, past time like infinity and end up at future time like infinity. And it, I basically doubled it to show a particle that comes in from scry minus and exit at scry plus, but otherwise there is an uh, S2 over every point mod Z2 for one three signature. So what I want to say is that basically that celestial sphere cross section here is what I'm saying is, is, is my place where this conformal field theory is going to live. And the point is, is that if I want to capture the initial or final data for massless scattering, then my boundary is null. And so that's the main difference between um, the setup with the cylinder and putting correlators in the boundary. I have something now in, in Minkowski space that I'd also have in the sitter, which is I need to deal with basically connecting in and out, I guess, depending on the patches that you're using in the sitter case. So let's try to compare two, I guess, maybe precedents for a flat space hologram. The one is, okay, so instead of, say, I have some um, local quantum field theory in the bulk, and then I'm only competing S matrix elements. So I can merge that picture of saying, okay, well, the S matrix, there's only on shell states. Um, I have some initial data scattering up to some final data, and I look at the, the probability of that overlap. Or I have instead, like, so, so that's basically co-dimension one by nature of being on shell. And then in the ADS-CFT context, I get co-dimension one by going out to the boundary and I'm looking at correlators on this boundary. So those two pictures are actually consistent with taking the flat space limit of the right-hand side. When I think about taking my Cauchy slice and pushing myself up to future or past null infinity. And so when I do that, Basically, I'm just saying I'm going to prepare my in-state and my out-state that I would use as my input for some like, collider experiment. And think of that as literally being prepared by putting some operators um, in my space-time in the very far past and the very far future. And it's convenient for me to do so in a manner for massless scattering that really does pretend that it's a long scry minus or scry plus, so these null hypersurfaces, as opposed to just a Cauchy slice that's a constant time slice. And part of the reason why it's nice to do that is because it starts to give you a slightly more local picture from the point of view of the celestial sphere of the excitations that I want to create. So with just some play of, with um, the order of limits, so I'm always going to send my r to infinity first to reach this conformal boundary before I look at limits of this coordinate u, which is along this conformal boundary. And when I do that, basically the rapidly oscillating phase of a plane wave will be such that this term here would be swamped uh, if R goes infinity, unless I'm really close to the angle of the momentum and the point on the celestial sphere being aligned. And so when I do that, what happens essentially is that if I wanted to prepare a plane wave, so just a standard, like, I guess, input for like a Feynman diagram, in this space-time picture, I have to smear with a certain Fourier transform a, the, like the boundary limit of my bulk field operator along a generator of scry. So the thing I want to emphasize here is we're really just trying to attach a space-time picture to the things that you're setting up in the S matrices that you're familiar with. And I could similarly do the, do the same thing with a massive guy where I need to be careful about how I smear in her I plus or I minus. But this perspective is useful because, um, like as I'll get to later, we can basically merge kind of our understanding of like the, this phase space from like canonical formalisms in general relativity and um, what you're used to from perturbative quantum field theory if you self it. So when I say I'm going to then dimensionally reduce to the celestial sphere, what I'm basically just doing is using the fact that we have a Lorenz uh, invariant theory. And so each of my operators, there's some little group transformation for the massless case. Um, they're going to be Lorenz covariant. And Lorenz transformations of Minkowski space act as the global conformal transformations in the celestial sphere. So if I wanted to say, let me hand you a celestial CFT, like in a kind of trivial sense, you already can do that, because all it is is just a change of basis. And so that's not that interesting, but at least it's not like you're screwed from the beginning because like, yes, you can do this. This is just kinematics. And so a lot of the downside to, I guess, setting up some of the stuff is there's a sense in which we're really just doing um, some intertwiners between different representations of the Poincaré group. So in this case, we're preferring a Lorenz basis. So why would we want to do this? Okay, 
So the point is, is that basically there are going to be two, so if I say I'm a celestial holographer, this is my little pitch. There's kind of two, like a more extreme version of like, I mean, it's a celestial CFT. And there's a, like a more relaxed version where, yes, the space time picture helps. So the first thing that hopefully I can convince everybody of is that examining both the asymptotic space time perspective as well as the amplitude manifestations of a given structure can be beneficial. So you can see kind of what, when um, you look at what like, Claudia was presenting about um, how the two to two S matrix behaves as a function of a complexified Mandelson invariance, we're thinking of that as being complexifications of null infinity because we basically have an isomorphism between the on-shell states and this conformal boundary. So that's useful if we think about maybe how we think like structures that scry minus and scry plus are causally connected and things like that to be worried about um, collinear limits for in and out versus in and in. Um, and then the second thing, which is maybe the more, like you have to be in that little niche to really, really believe in it, uh, is that the celestial CFT is further um, useful, this dimensional reduction that we're gonna do from this conformal boundary, which has all of these different types of components that we're kind of gluing together, depending if it's a massless case or a massive particle, um, is useful because it elucidates a larger symmetry algebra. So I'll definitely show that there's this larger symmetry algebra, but again, I'm happy to fight through why, why we believe in that so much. Okay, so let's go through one example of where, this is, this is a little bit older, of where this is actually paid off. So it's not just like, we're gonna change the spaces for the S matrix, what have we learned from it? So basically this infrared triangle connecting some features of the low energy behavior of a take one gauge boson soft in quantum field theory to some observables that one can go out and measure, which are signatures of the fact that this asymptotically flat approximation is useful to some extent. When I say I know my cosmological constant is non-zero, but I'm measuring some um, in spiraling binary systems, gravitational radiation, to what extent can I really assume that the boundary conditions for like where radiation's hitting me are effectively as if I had like an asymptotically flat space time. So, there's some measurement here that you can do, which is predicted by Einstein's equations, but at least like the fact that it would be non-zero or have this universal value is tied into also the boundary conditions. So there's something that you're learning there about the approximation. And then finally, this notion of asymptotic symmetries, which comes from the fact that when I go to this flat limit, instead of my um, uh, standard, like just taking lambda to zero, and I'm careful about making sure to allow for radiation, I get a richer space of vacua. So you have this pattern, and the first instance was like Weinberg soft theorem from the 60s, connecting to the um, BMS group that was also studied in the 60s, and each of these examples were known back in the day. Um, but the nice thing is about seeing how universal that pattern is, you can find new soft theorems and whatnot. So basically, let me just set up that last corner because I think this is important to emphasize where these extra symmetries are coming from, is, okay, I'm looking at my metric near scry, and basically have a good gauge so that I can describe with some coordinate system, the radiative um, data near this conformal boundary. And so basically, this one over R fall off is set up by Bondi, Vanderbilt, Metzner, and Sachs. And if I then have chosen a good set of gauge, a good gauge, so that I understand what each of these coordinates basically mean, like so R is going to be a coordinate for like an um, outgoing uh, null geodesic then what I'm trying to do is look at what diffeomorphisms I can do that still preserve that class of falloff. So this is the class of space-times that I'm in rather than a particular space-time who's um, basically I need to have, um, say, an isometry. No, I just need basically an asymptotic symmetry. So that's the difference, and that's why it can be larger. So basically any set of diffeomorphisms that preserve those classes of falloff, so that classes of metric, rather than exactly um, keeping one metric fixed, becomes this asymptotic symmetry group, and that can be much larger than Poincaré. And so this is where these extra symmetries are coming from. And so Bondi, Vandenberg, Metzner, and Sachs knew about super translations, but these super rotations were kind of a proposal that was a bit like unaccepted at the time, because you're essentially allowing punctures in the celestial sphere, and that's kind of singular and something that you wouldn't want to do if you wanted to say like the metric is supposed to um, be regular there. So just as a concrete example of where kind of this has paid off the space-time perspective of this as matrix uh, soft theorems have paid off, is you have this proposal to allow super rotations. You then see what would be in that little triangle the um, soft theorem analog of that symmetry. So Cochazo and Strominger found that. And then you also find a new memory effect. So you basically fill in a whole new iteration just because there's pr this proposal from the space-time perspective and that can, like um, covariant phase space methods that you'd want to maybe look at this larger symmetry group. Now, once you have that symmetry as, okay, the S matrix obeys it because of the soft theorem, you would want to try to interpret its word identity. 
And so instead of the Lorenz group, you actually have a Vera Soro symmetry. So already this 2D description is becoming more interesting because we have this same thing that you'd see in a 2D CFT where you have this promotion of the global conformal group to the Vera Soro group. Um, and, and moreover, you have a candidate stress tensor coming from this graviton mode in the bulk when you go to a boost basis. And furthermore, if you want to kind of go back to this like, interplay between going to the boost basis and, um, and this candidate stress tensor, so all of this was basically some years ago, but recently enough, we also see that we can get the full loop corrections to these guys by basically taking very, um, very strictly the fact that we want these objects to transform correctly under the asymptotic symmetry group, yada, yada. So the cor corrections that would be kind of ambiguous if you just looked at the momentum space um, form of the amplitude kind of get pinned down um, by looking at the covariant phase space. So that's nice. But the better thing about, and something that's been more exciting in recent years, so maybe last year or so, is that in this boost basis, there's no reason to stop at like the subleanings off theorem for some reason. So essentially, if I look at my, um, this transform of my amplitudes to go to this boost basis, which involve basically integrating over all energy scales, and I look at the singular structure in this variable that corresponds to the conformal dimension, it picks out a whole tower of soft modes and then I can look at their collinear limits and construct basically an algebra like I would if I would really treated those operators as living in a 2D CFT and I get this W infinity symmetry. So that's kind of neat. It's like, why is that here? So the understanding of it from the point of view of like, um, just like classical GR, so would be from uh, symmetries of anti self dual gravity. But you start to build up this picture where you have more and more ingredients in this dictionary and then you can start trying to look for particular concrete realizations of a celestial CFT, like by what you mean for this like hologram. So some subsector of gravity is still maybe a consistent theory of quantum gravity that you can map directly to an actual um, 2D CFT. So that's nice. So basically, the goal of the celestial holographer would be to convert um, what Claudia is talking about to a like space-time perspective, so at least we can kind of see what's going on. And then more ambitiously would be also to be able to um, kind of bootstrap amplitudes from the soft and collinear limits. So looking at, you have this continuous set of conformal dimensions because you really do have a uh, u-coordinate that you've dimensionally reduced, so it's not compact. But somehow the data at these integer points is really all you might seem to need. And then if you really do have that, plus you have um, the understanding of the celestial LP when you take two operators near each other, then could, one could hope to try to set up some sort of bootstrap program, but the, we're in early days with that. And so let's do a very brief Susie shout out because the audience is a Susie audience. So where have um, insights from supersymmetry helped us? Uh, one concrete example is where uh, basically the soft theorems uh, equivalence to the Ward identity. Um, if the easiest cases are where you have a gauge symmetry because basically you're just doing Gauss's law in some weird cut of your space time. Um, but it's less obvious when you have um, particles without a gauge symmetry. So like the soft Fotino, is related by supersymmetry to one that is, and it has a soft theorem. And so you can really push through this triangular equivalence in an instance where maybe the intuition is, is um, like uh, less clear for why you would have expected the full set of things, but it kind of guides you to know, like take it seriously, use that soft theorem and reinterpret it as some current in this 2D CFT. So you can do that. Um, also, wherever supersymmetry is helpful for an amplitude computation is helps for us because we're just transforming that. So that's an easy check mark. And then similarly to the stress tensor, you can define a supercurrent from the soft gravitino. And if you look at those algebras, so like the super BMS algebra, it's actually a little bit different than what you'd expect from a superconformal algebra. So those type of tensions raise some interesting questions for what kind of are some ongoing questions now. So the main question that I've, I guess, played with recently is the role of the IR regulators. So essentially, if you want to have a non-zero level for your, like, so central extensions for things, you need to somehow include either loop effects that introduce an IR regulator or um, deform the symmetry algebra so that you can look at sectors where basically you have um, now the IR regulator coming in and giving you um, a non-zero level. Similarly, in, along the lines of understanding interesting things through the S matrix, we want to understand crossing both in the 2D conformal block sense as well as in and out sense, and that is closely tied to analytic continuations. So looking at the analytic structure as I move punctures around in this complexified celestial sphere and change signatures. And then finally, building up toy models where we basically have a set of necessary ingredients for celestial CFT. And then basically one particular fruitful example is looking at this conformally soft sector where basically spontaneous symmetry breaking of these asymptotic symmetries is governing everything. So 
that's what I wanted to say. And thank you guys so much for letting me do my little pitch for my, uh, the thing I've been working on. Great. Oh. Run out of a Thank you. Very nice review, Sabrina. So, a uh, few questions. First of all, uh, in higher dimensions, yeah. you're doing it four, three plus one dimension, I assume, right? Most of the time. So, if you do higher dimension, presumably you have a celestial sphere there too, yeah. and you also expect a CFT there? Yeah, yes. So, we expect a CFT in the same sense, like Lorenz and Mary. I mean, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, the extent to which the mileage is, is helpful, um, somehow there's, there's parts of it that are a little murky between going to higher D, but definitely you have the same um, CFT. I would say that basically most of this, the kinematic stuff just directly carries over. There's some properties of these like towers of null states that you see in 2D that would be a little bit more complicated if I tried to write down like how do I find primary descendants from a mode with spin 2 down to some other mode that it's going to couple to. So there's some structure that maybe will be less rich in higher D, but you can set up the, the first step, which is just like mapping to this boost basis in any dimension. Um, so uh, the other thing is that, uh, if I understood correctly uh, from other talks, that mm -hmm. your CFDs yeah. are non-unitary generally, right? Yeah. And uh, that's related, for example, to the level you were mentioning, maybe, I don't know, or complex, num you get complex dimensions, if I remember, right? Yeah, so we have complex dimensions. So the reason why I want to be a little bit careful of just saying, you're right, like, it's not unitary, is because I think there's some, like, okay, so, so if I wanted to capture just radiative states, I know my conformal dimension needs to be on the principal series. But there is a sense in which this, like, tower of, like, W infinity generator, sorry, um, are essentially as if you analytically continued delta to the complex plane and then restricted to integer values. So I wouldn't put it past a future version of like some model for some, like, sorry, sorry, if, sorry, I just wanted to model like the, the IR divergences in 40, which again now is restricting to 40, then I could have a free boson that basically captures this like factorized part, which is the soft sector um, of this, uh, of, of QED. So what I want to say is that there's a chance that there's still some like more standard CFTs that are sectors within this guy. And so maybe some mileage can be made there, at least in 40, if I really wanted like, to look at the, like, the IR divergence part. But I agree that in general, we don't expect it to be the standard unitary CFT. You don't expect. And no. do you have a structure, uh, you don't have a specific CFT in mind, other than the fact that Virosoro seems to act? We have more than Virosoro now. So I would say, the, like, I mean, W, w version of Virosoro. Yeah, so you have W, yeah, exactly. So you have, I would say that you expect like we're adding to this list. I think with Herman, we were trying to argue that there's also some notion of like chaos and things like that. But we're trying to like see what do you need to have in this guy. So the W infinity symmetry uh, seems to be there. There's issues about if it's more natural, just look at a single like helicity sector when you want to exploit that. Um, we also have, uh, I mean, whatever like charges, like so basically whatever external scattering states you have, if there's like some, the charges you would associate labeling those, you'd have a different asymptotic symmetry for those and then more restraints on like what you'd want in your theory. But because gravity has to be there, you would have the step infinity. And then I think most of the other things kind of follow from that, um, that we're saying have to be there. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so let me, I'm going to punt to some extent, but I'm going to try to basically say whatever you know in ADS CFD, I'm confident there's a way to translate it more directly or not, at least when you're not doing a strong weak duality version <laughs> um, to the, this case. Because, so what we're basically saying is, okay, I'm taking all of my bulk operators to the boundary. So one first, I guess, instance of like a cutoff in this 2D theory, because I'm further dimensionally reducing, is this scale that's corresponding to taking collinear limits. So if I look at, um, I have certain like modes with logarithmic correlators that correspond to dressings. Um, and so I would say that it's natural kind of like cutoff scale in, the, in the, the lower dimensional theory is this collinear limit scale in the bulk. So to me, um, while I can't directly necessarily 
answer like the, the exact question you were asking. I can hint at a couple, I guess, related questions, and then you can like, call me out on it so we can, we can reiterate in this. So basically, the IR um, divergences in my um, 40 theory kind of come from two sources. One is this like, large R limit, if I need to cut that off, and one is the late U limit. So I think that the ratio of those two is connected to this, um, I guess, UV divergence in the 2D theory. But that's not quite answering your question, so maybe ask again something else about building off of that that I can answer better. Yeah, the question is, yeah. 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 Oh. Yeah. So the IR divergences in the S matrix correspond to basically the fact that I want to strip off those IR divergences with dressings that basically make all of my operators invariant under large gauge transformations. So the fact that I have an IR divergence is essentially the fact that I have my operators near uh, null infinity are not actually gauge invariant under these diffeomorphisms or, or gauge transformations that make it out to the boundary. And so I basically dress those away with, instead of with Wilson lines, with basically this vertex operator that also shifts under these gauge transformations. And that little soft sector that kind of factors out um, would encode all of the IR divergences in 40. I think it should come down to the fact that, like, if I, if I try to set myself up a little bit better with, like, the fact that I'm supposed to have this conformal boundary and the data on, like, a la Ashtakar or somebody, like, not necessarily in bond gauge the way that I've set it up, but I think if you try to um, be a little bit cleaner about setting up the, the, the scattering data in terms of the fact that you're supposed to be able to do conformal rescalings and, like, uh, of this 40 metric, uh, that you might be able to see that more clearly, but I wouldn't have anything better to say about it now. Thank you.